welcome to our first of, I hope, as many pro prep roundtable discussions with the coaches and bodybuilders at Pro Prep Coaching. I'm Dr. Andrew Chappelle. I'm the host and head coach at Pro Prep Coaching, and I'm going to be emceeing what is uh, hopefully going to be a, an interesting and insightful discussion today around uh, hypertrophy and different training methods and, and techniques that we can all utilize. Guys, if you like this content, be sure to leave a like, leave a comment down below, subscribe to our channel, and if you think that we can help you, then by all means, please do get in touch with us at www.proprepcoaching.com, and you can follow us in all the familiar places that you can expect. So if you want to follow us on Instagram or on Facebook, then we're available at Pro Prep Coaching uh, on there. Um, so without any further ado, um, I'm going to get into this. We're going to ask the guys to describe themselves um, on here, give us a little bit about their uh, their backgrounds. And I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to go to yourself, Dave, first and foremost. So tell us about yourself, Dave, and uh, hey about guys. your and what you bring to the table. Hey guys, I'm David Taylor. I'm one of the coaches here at Pro Prep Coaching. I've been a personal trainer and latterly an online coach for nearly 13 years now. Uh, I would say my specialities probably lie in injury rehabilitation and in helping people get from the start to the finish of their journey. So consistency, maintaining things over a long period of time and keeping people in the right headspace while they train. And, uh, and you're a bodybuilder as well, Dave. You've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Uh, first show in 2013. Don't go looking up any photos of that one. Uh, last show, 2020, did quite well with the UKDFBA and competing this year as well. So yeah, I love the game. Excellent. A British champion, no less. Okay, let's move on to uh, to Natalie Woods. Tell us a bit about yourself, Nat. Hey guys, I'm Natalie Woods. So um, I've probably been kind of in the fitness industry and into bodybuilding for about 10 years now. My, my background is in nutritional therapy. So I have a special interest in kind of managing chronic conditions and maximizing performance through nutrition. Um, I have personal experience of sort of a body transformation and recomping. Um, so again, that's another specialism of mine. Um, bodybuilding background so I've been competing for sort of two seasons now as a master's figure competitor so um, a British champion last year um, which was good so <laughs> twice two times British champion actually <laughs> um, in master's figure and in my off season at the moment competing again in 2023. Excellent thank you very much Natalie for um, your introduction and bringing your expertise and then last but by no means least let's uh, move to yourself Rob. Hey, I am Rob. I am a competitive bodybuilder as well and a PT and online coach. I have been PTing for four and a half years now, online coaching for the last year. Um, I am a previous British champion in the teenage division. Um, I am a British um, champion in the junior division and I'm moving into um, men's open career in bodybuilding and you're a very experienced bodybuilder Rob how many shows did you do last year alone I done seven shows in my last season and managed to place top four in every single one of them came away with three first places did yeah. all right yeah you did, you did all right <laughs> it was very very okay which leaves myself to introduce myself so I'm Dr Andrew Chappelle I'm a PhD in human nutrition I also have a master's in human nutrition and a undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science. I've been bodybuilding since 2006. I think I've done over 30 competitions, seven world finals, and this year will be the seventh and eighth, maybe even ninth pro show that I'll be competing in as, a, as well. I also run the WMBF United Kingdom with my partner, Stiff, and I am the, uh, the head coach and co-owner of Pro Prep Coaching. So there we go, guys. That's uh, that's us. Now, without any further ado, let's uh, let's get into this from here. So, the first thing I just wanted to do um, before we got into this discussion about hypertrophy is just briefly describe some basic mechanisms uh, around hypertrophy. And when we talk about hypertrophy, I'm just talking about muscle growth and um, per se. But the thing that you have to understand and realize about muscle growth and, and hypertrophy is that hypertrophy occurs in response to any sort of stressor, and provided that there is sufficient rest in place, a uh, sufficient nutrient, and that that stress is at sufficient intervals, that is how we get progression occurring in the, uh, the hypertrophy rank. Are we all okay with that as a sort of basic definition of what how hypertrophy takes place? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Now, hypertrophy, as I said, it's, it's down there a combination of stress. So that stress can be metabolic. So the using up of all the phosphates within your muscles, the lactate buildup that we see, the depletion of muscle glycogen stores um, from air. The stress can also be mechanical in nature. So if our sarcomeres, which in case our, uh, our muscle fibers are damaged in any sort of way, then it causes our body to sort of adapt to this. Um, it can occur as a consequence of edema, and that's what we call swelling. So that can be both transient edema, so we talk about pump in the gym, but also that longer-term swelling that occurs when we get a lot of inflammation in the area at the same time, which causes our body, again, to adapt to the, the stress. And in response to all these things, our body releases a whole milieu of different hormones in response to allow us to adapt. So we're all familiar with concepts like testosterone and IGF-1, so that's insulin-like growth factor 1, helping us to promote the um, the response and uh, muscle hypertrophy from there. So that's a little bit about how um, muscle hypertrophy kind of takes place. Are we, are we happy with that, guys? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Okay, so there was different topics. We all had homework to go away here and uh, and have a little look at. Um, we wanted to sort of know, based on the pro prep coaches here, and uh, based on their own personal experience uh, working with people and maybe their, their research that they might have carried out as well, what they sort of think works very, very well for, um, for muscle hypertrophy. And we had topics such as the total amount of sets that you need to perform, the frequency that you need to exercise at, exercise selection, um, advanced training techniques, and then intensity. Now, there's a lot going on there, and I think we're being ambitious if we're going to get through it all, but we'll uh, we'll try our best. But I just want to open up the floor here to uh, to you guys to come in here. So put your hand up and see who wants to go first, and then we'll go to them on uh, on there in terms of what we think is good for um, hypertrophy. And, and don't hold back on the, the anecdotes on uh, on this one as, uh, as well. So who wants to talk about sets first? Okay, yeah, David. I'll talk about let's, some sets. Let's your, let's so your, it's interesting, you, eh, because... Ahead from things like bodybuilding.com, even before the advent of Instagram and Facebook and all the information we get from YouTube and stuff, there was always kind of like these specific gold standards. And I remember the very first one I heard and read on these forums was you had to do a hundred reps on a muscle group in a week long period to get sufficient hypertrophy to, in the muscle to get growth. So sufficient stimulus to get growth. That was one of those kind of like golden rules. So that could be like 10 sets of 10. So you could do three exercises for sets of 10 and you do all the maths for short sets, longer sets. But it was very much like focused on the amount of volume, how many reps you actually needed to be. But kind of coming at this slightly sideways from what we did, I, I think you can actually get hypertrophy from all rep ranges and from all different styles of training as well. Because from my perspective, as someone whose body's like made of glass, I don't really lift that heavy. And I've found latterly in my lifting career, as I've been in my 30s, I've lifted lighter than I ever did when I was in my 20s. I lifted probably the lightest now I have in 10 years, and yet my body looks the best. Now, part of that, from, from my perspective, is down to how I train. So making sure you have the appropriate intensity, because when you talk about hypertrophy, it's about said specific adaptation to impose demands. So it's got to be demanding on the muscles. You've got to ask them difficult questions. So having the appropriate demands through your intensity and lifting in the right way, correct tempo, correct form, you know, quality of movement over heavy weights has always been how, I, how I've like done well with building muscle. So for me, there's, a, there's so much more to it than just reps and sets. Okay, Dave, thank what you. What do you guys think? Thank, yeah, thank I mean, you very much for that. that I that think that's, that's really interesting because this is what I was going to say, is that it's there's no definitive number. It's very individualised. And I think, um, you know, everyone will have kind of a maximum recoverable sort of volume that they can work to. And pushing beyond that, say someone trains their legs and they're still sore seven days later, you know that actually in all likelihood, you know, they've, you know, induced damage that the body can't repair and actually that can be detrimental. So this is where I think it's really important to get the recovery feedback um, from the individual and to gauge what sort of volume is ideal for them. Um, and I mean, in terms of sort of sets and reps, etc., 
I find kind of mixing it up, you know, during, you know, any one session um, is probably the most effective approach that I've kind of come across. Um, you know, so having like that high volume component, a component whether it might be a pre-exhaust, um, you know, or, or a finisher, um, or even a back offset um, within, you know, your compounds. Um, so kind of having that mixture. So you've got kind of the different stimuluses going on in any one session. Absolutely. I think that's so important. Yeah. Can I nail you still, guys, uh, down on this one? So sets wise, I mean, the, the 100 reps um, that you need to do to get that sort of that minimum growth. I mean, it's, as a rule of sort of thumb or a loose one, I kind of understand the concept where it's come from, um, from, uh, from there. But if we said like how many sets you actually needed rather than, okay, the reps and things like that, what is the actual amount of sets that we, we should be doing? And, and that you came in with that maximum recoverable volume, which which I thought was really interesting um, on there. So I'll go to, I'll go to yourself, Rob, and I'll get your take on it and then come back to yourself, Nat and Dave, and sort of get that that set sort of idea on where we can come from on, uh, on there. What what do you think, Dave? Uh, sorry, Rob. So with with sets, um, when I am, um, if I was to take an example of pro uh, programming someone, it would be a case of measuring their experience with um, their recovery capabilities. So someone who's quite new into this, you will get a hypertrophy response from potentially just doing 12 working sets. And when I, when I say working sets, I, I'm not counting your, your warm-ups. When I say working sets, sets that you know are adding a bit to your physique breaking the muscle down. So 12 working sets up to a maximum for someone like myself, who's been training for a long time, I wouldn't be pushing anyone above around 20 at the, at the higher rep range um, in terms of the hypertrophy response. So it, it depends on how, how well you can take these sets to failure, which I know we'll talk about later on and how much intensity you can put in each set but when it comes down to experienced athletes I think you can get away with that good mark of 12 to 15 working hard sets and you can break that down however you want to in your workout is yep. that kind of what you're you're agreeing with or thinking no I, I like that I think that's again the 12 to 15 is quite a, a nice idea I would sort of come back to you in, on the specifics of it. are we talking per workout are we talking per muscle group on this what what would you say so per workout per muscle group I think um these larger muscle groups like like quads for example I'll take, I think quads or legs in general is a good example. So if I was doing a leg session, I would be aiming for a maximum of between six and eight sets per, per muscle group. Same thing for another one. Smaller muscle groups like side delts, um, biceps, triceps, you can get away with potentially as low as four working sets but depending on recovery capabilities, you could bring that up to eight as well. So I'd say between six and eight for someone starting. So if anyone's watching this and they're trying to get into the gym, if you can nail that six to eight sets per muscle group, I think that's a really good starting point. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with that. And then I guess you were talking in the concept of training more than one muscle in a workout to get to that 15 to 20 set. Yeah, so if you were doing two muscle groups, her workout and you're doing the lower range that's um two muscle groups six sets on each boom you've got 12 if you bring it up to eight you're closer to or even less you're 15 16 that kind of range that we were talking about there cool all right it's interesting yeah. eh? because i would actually i would go the opposite way if someone was a beginner i would probably give them more volume than someone who's an experienced competitor and the reason being, there's a great analogy that uh, Jeff Alberts, the godfather, 3DMJ, mentioned the other day when he said, you're talking about lifting is a lot like other sports. If you take NFL for an example, the peewee coach will have the same tactics for the running back as the NFL coach. 
but there's a reason why the peewee team doesn't always get the play perfect and it's because they don't have the experience they haven't been through that play 10 20 50 times before so their actual delivery is not going to be as good as the guy at the nfl players and if you take a beginner gym is like a peewee guy and someone who's been doing it for 10 years is like an nfl guy so you don't need to do as many sets to get the right rpe to get the right hypertrophy to get the right you know f- demand on the muscles as someone who's a beginner would because they won't be getting those great peak contractions in every rep they won't be getting the perfect depth on every single set so i would say i mean volume wise you would probably be looking for more for a beginner you'd probably be looking for like 100 to 120 reps for the muscles and work that out across your sets whether that's 10 sets of 10 whether it's like two two exercises where it's four sets on your chest and then one exercise where it's two and then as you get more experience you can get away with maybe even only doing two or three working sets on upper pec two or three working sets on lower pec and then a little bit on like all over so it's it's a really hard question to answer andy i gotta be honest with you well that, that that's i knew it was a hard question to answer i, I knew it was that's that's why we posed it and it's why we have to have these these sort of discussions i i know i was thinking about this before i came on to this this sort of call and um I mean, we've got kind of rules and guidelines and things like this on this, but I think if you're not being pragmatic in your approach, then you're not coaching. Mm-hmm. Simple, simple as. You're just cookie cutting. So you, you have to be pragmatic about what works best for, for absolutely everyone. Uh, or sorry, what works for one individual compared to the, the other one. Um, if I quote yourself, Natalie, I mean, the amount of sets that you did when you first started compared to where you're at just now, I mean, how, how has your training changed around the amount of sets that you've done? I wouldn't say, oh, say the amount of sets has actually changed, um, but obviously it's, you know, I'm moving on to another topic here entirely on like the intensity. So it's not necessarily the amount of sets has changed, but clearly the percentage of my kind of one rep max on those working sets, you know, is a lot greater. And therefore my rep ranges were a lot higher when I first started out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, it is about kind of, you know, it, making those neural when you first begin making those neural connections and getting yeah. into the movement pattern um so doing kind of the higher reps lower weight allows you to you know develop you know the correct movement patterns before you move on as kind of a more experienced um trainer really so i mean <clears throat> i tend to probably stick to sort of three hard working sets much the same as i probably would have done three sets as a beginner but just at a very different intensity mm-hmm. I, I think that's good what you've just said there. And it kind of ties into what you were saying, Dave, about the, the mm-hmm. PV coach compared to the experience. As you move up the ranks and you get better at training, you can just put, the, the sets become higher quality, don't they? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I mean, that's difficult to probably quantify to, to measure that quality versus um, someone who's not training at the same intensity because, and when I say intensity, I don't mean percentage of one rep max i mean how much effort they, they put into the set um rpe wise and and how much activation they, they actually get which again difficult to to sort of measure but the quality the quality definitely goes up and that allows you to get better workouts and and one thing that i always stress when i go and train with people for the first time and i've trained with lots of bodybuilding champions down, down the years is i'm always surprised by how poor a lot of people's training is um, I really am. And, and it's what you were saying earlier on, Dave. It's people doing um, compound or isolation exercises and failing really to engage the muscle sufficiently and get the activation that they should be getting out of a, of a session. Just moving our weight from A to B rather than actually getting that good focus and, and that good tension. Just knowing when to, to control that, that contraction and think about what they're, they're actually doing. Um, Rob, do you want to come in here and add anything to this, this discussion about sets? Um, I think what you said there about your quality of sets um, is something that I um, relate to a lot. And over the years, obviously, I've um, not been doing it as long as, as uh, yourself, but learning how to put more effort into a set and over the years, I've probably come down to doing per, I'll break it down even per exercise from doing four sets per exercise and not having as much quality coming down to two, three at the most. 
and um, increasing that quality and not needing as many sets to fatigue the muscle and therefore create a, a kind of response that's gonna gonna build because that is the yeah. end, at the end of the day that is the idea we're not going into the gym to hit a specific number on the, the the bar or a specific number of reps or sets we're going into the gym to trigger the muscular response that's going to cause us to build bigger muscles because you don't have to deadlift like on stage at a bodyboarding show you don't need to do an overhead press sometimes the strongest guys are not necessarily the biggest guys so it's making sure that your training style matches what you're looking to get as an outcome afterwards and that's why like chasing hypertrophy is very different to chasing numbers on numbers on the bar i mean i i recall ronnie coleman famously saying about his deadlifts that he did those big 800 odd pound deadlifts where he did a double with and he said he could have done way more but the difference is that he got excellent activation through his whole body when he was doing those deadlifts and really felt it in the muscles and he was really training the muscle when he was doing that it's just for him he had to use a lot of weight because he was just a strong strong guy but he didn't feel the need to go even heavier and um, because it wouldn't have necessarily benefited him and um, i can tell you a little bit about the research guys if, if you want to hear what that says on the actual sets go for it unless anyone else has got anything that they want to come in here and um, i mean my own personal journey with, with sets is when I first started working out reading bodyball magazines and everything like that, I followed the plan that like Mr. Olympia did, thinking that that would help me be the best. So it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, massive volume trainer, 25 sets, a muscle group. And like I was lean, but I was in the gym for like three hours ago, easily just, just training and, and not recovering. And since then, I've been on a real odyssey in terms of the amount of um, sets and reps that I do and, and I really do resonate with what you're saying Rob what you're saying Natalie and what you're saying Dave and that the quality of my workouts is, is much better and I don't do near, nearly as much volume as, a, as I did in the past and um, the research on this kind of sort of indicates that if you look at the meta-analyses or the systematic reviews on it and um, you're probably looking at something in the region of around about between five to 15 sets mm -hmm. yeah so in nice studies, um, I mean, there was one that's came out by uh, Barbara Rello, for example, who did uh, a nice study where he equated five sets per muscle group, 10 sets per muscle group, 15 sets per muscle group, or um, 20 sets. So 5, 10, 15, 20. And what they do is they compare the amount of hypertrophy that takes place, and they also compare the 10 rep max. And what they see is diminishing returns. Once you get to that 15 sets, you don't necessarily get any more hypertrophy than what you're getting out of the five or the 10 sets. Um, and then the 20, you get even less. And that's including for strength and for hypertrophy. So that's that's a single study, but Schoenfield studied this a lot. There's lots of meta-analyses and training studies on this relating to set volume and frequency. And it's the same story because people are really interested in higher frequency training again. They're wanting to know, okay, right, well, if my biceps are weak, or my legs are weak, should I train it more frequently with more sets, more total volume? And they sort of show that, well, where the volume's equivalent, e.g. 15 sets split over two sessions or 10 sets set over two sessions, it, it doesn't really matter. And you get the same sort of hypertrophy and growth, which if you go by their conclusions, it sort of says that, well, it leaves the door open for exercisers to really choose whatever parameters are going to work best for them and what they most really enjoy doing. So, the magic number, and again, it fits in with other research that I've seen, is probably somewhere around about 12, 13, around about there for hypertrophy. Split across a week if you want to do it, or, or single frequency from, a, from there. Um, and then I'd come back to you and go, I mean, does that surprise you? No, it doesn't. I think the range mm. reflects, like, obviously the experience levels as well. Yeah. As yeah. that. And also it just shows that, like, the body's quite adaptable as well. Mm. You know, five sets, 15 sets, get a similar response was like, it's the right stimulus. So it's going to well, obviously I, change. I think that it's always worth reflecting on this. So like the show and field study, which I think has got about 25 studies in it, they're comparing like untrained and trained individuals, males and females and all at different levels. And you're only ever looking at an average. Mm. You're only ever looking at what on average is best. And with any sort of population, there's always outliers. And it comes back to what you were saying earlier on, 
uh, which is a great point, Natalie, about maximum recoverable volume. Some people can do more mm. and some people do need more, but it's a sort of classic, like more is not always better uh, at the end of the day. And sometimes less is, is more, I think is a, a real big take home for, uh, for that one. Um, has anyone got anything else they want to say on this topic before we move on to, to exercise selection? And I'm going to come to, uh, to you first on this, Rob. Uh, I've got nothing else to add. Um, I think the studies were there, the opinions were there. So we'll move on to exercise selection. Okay, so exercise selection. Um, own experience, coaching experience, any research experience, how important is it? I think it's the most important thing. Um, there's there's a lot of different reasons why you need to select the correct exercises. You've got, I think the biggest one for me is actually somewhat enjoyment. You need oh, to yeah. enjoy doing the exercises that you are because when you enjoy a movement, it's easier to progress on it. Uh, you'll want to go into your sessions. You'll go in with a good kind of mental state of I want to do this exercise and therefore you perform better on it saying that not everybody likes doing everything so sometimes you do have to bite the bullet and do the things that you know if you've got a lagging body part you might have to do the exercises that you need to do but in terms of exercise selection for me it's all about picking exercises that you connect well with you must be able to get that mind muscle connection to to the muscle to create them micro tears that you hear about and break it down get that pump and in and like i say enjoy it so picking exercises that are gonna um increase the blood volume to that muscle group you enjoy it but also making sure you're hitting it's bodybuilding so we need to make sure we hit that muscle in different angles different movements different movement patterns um and everything like that. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that, um, Rob. Okay, Natalie, what, what do you think? What's your take on the, the exercise selection? So um, I, th I think it's really important, like as Rob mentioned, about uh, exercises that you connect well with, because with the best player in the world, we're all put together slightly differently. So there might be exercises, that, no matter how hard you try, you're just not feeling them. And I always, I always think it's, you know, never take the approach to thinking that you have to do you know things in one way and one way only and, you know and if you don't connect with it you have to include that exercise because everyone's doing it um it's finding the different ways of working that muscle where the connection is switched on for you there's never only one way of doing things and i, I would always say that there's never a necessity to include a particular exercise for everyone you know there are so many different ways that you can target that muscle and it's about finding the one that works best you know for the individual um, and you also have to take into account things like, um, you know, injuries, et cetera, um, niggles. There might be some exercises that it's really not a good idea for a certain individual to do. And again, there's always ways around it. And I've never come across anyone where we can't find something effective, you know, even if they do have restrictions, um, you know, due to previous injuries and stuff like that. Okay, I think that's a very sensible approach Natalie thank you for, for that um, Dave exercise selection how important is it does it make or break really important and it's interesting that you asked from a coaching and from our own experience as well yep because obviously when you've got your coach's hat on it you want the client to be consistently adhering to the plan you've laid out for them so as the guys have said it needs to be something they enjoy if they hate deadlifts and you put in deadlifts their adherence is maybe going to be weaker you know, they've got to be able to connect to the exercises because exercises they're connecting with, they're going to have better intensity. They're going to be getting a better quality of movement because mind muscle connection and quality of movement are very, very linked. And uh, they're much more likely to stick with it for the long term, which is going to give them that kind of consistency. But as well as that, from a coach's perspective, it's about making sure you're picking the right exercises to enhance their physique. I mean, one of the first things you said to me when we started working together, Andy, was that we needed to bring up my my rear shots and bring up my back so my entire training regime was shaped around that as being the primary goal and then it was finding the right exercises for me to do that things that i connected well with that are actually going to level it up because at the end of the day from the coach's perspective we've got to think about the long game as well it's not just about enjoying it and 
you know, connecting. It's about, okay, what are we looking to get out of this? Are we, where we want to grow? We want to have a balanced physique. So I think like the choice is super important. And from an injury perspective as well, unfortunately, plenty of experience there. Like you aren't able to maintain intensity if you're always worried about an injury, like bent over rows and deadlifts. I mean, when my back is healthy, I can deadlift over 200 kilos. But the last time I deadlifted over 200 kilos was like five years ago. So when you look at like what I could actually do on the bar on an RPE scale, if one of my clients was saying that I was like an RPE six, I'd be like, get in the bin. Your deadlifts need to be heavier than that. It's like, I can't because my back's sore. I would immediately take it out because if they can't actually push themselves, they're losing time that could be spent doing something at a higher level with a different exercise. Okay. No, I, I like that. That's, that's all very useful um, content there on the, on the exercise selection. Um, I'm, go I'm going to come back to you, Rob, on, uh, on this one. Um, pitfalls people fall into in terms of selecting exercises. And then I want Dave and Natalie's on this one as well. So t tell me the pitfalls, Rob. Right, I'm going to go straight in with um, an opinion that I have that a lot of people will probably agree with, some will not, is people need to stop choosing the easier exercises and need to look back at the bread and butter of bodybuilding. Um, one pitfall you see is replacing these heavy compound movements with smaller isolation movements that they're not actually able to get the same load on that muscle because they're picking an easier exercise. So I think a pitfall is not doing these, like I say, bread and butter movements, the things that are the big compound movements, using barbells, using dumbbells, things like that. That's not only gonna help you increase the muscle you're working, it's all the, things around it, your stabilizers, um, and even just injury prevention. If you can get good at using dumbbells and barbells, being able to stabilize them is a big thing. So first pitfall would be not choosing the, the, the compound movements and going straight for an isolation. Okay, I think that, that's a good one. I think that um, ties in with what Dave was kind of saying about exercise selection and quality and things like that obviously we, we mean choosing the right exercises which makes sense for the the individual you don't need to avoid absolutely everything um natalie pitfalls i think overcomplicating things i think rather than sort of focusing on the basics then there's so many you know stuff out there online that people see which is almost trying to combine Two types of you know, two types of thing into one movement. Give us an example. So I'm thinking about these things like where people are stuck stood on like uh, like a bosu ball trying to like do presses and then a squat and stuff like that. And you think, well, actually, <laughs> you know, you're obviously not going to be able to use a heavy weight doing. <laughs> so you know, keep your stability exercises in <laughs> separate yep. to your actual. So it's just trying to open and just forgetting to stick to the basics. And then I think following on from that is people I've I've had a lot of experience of people sort of coming into a session thinking that in one session they have to do every single exercise they've ever heard of in their entire life and you know they end up getting no quality throughout the session because they're just splitting from one thing to another and they might be doing know, 15 different exercises because they're paranoid if they don't do everything they know in one session that it's not effective but actually it's you know they're not getting any quality out of it. So doing too much and overcomplicating. Okay, I think those, those are good pitfalls. And I've seen the, the Bosun balls come. That was a real trend about 15 years ago, Dave. You'll remember that when you were first in training. Mm -hmm. The ball was the thing that you had to do with every exercise because yeah. core training and stability was the big thing. So I, that, that trend's kind of gone out of fashion. <laughs> the latest trend is everything now has to be done with a rubber band. Yeah. Um, not that exercise um, engineers and equipment specialists haven't already designed machines really well with that sort of tension in mind already, although there, there, there is merit in some of it, or uh, everything is now with cuffs. Uh, it has to be with cuffs, and yeah, the, these are the latest trends. I'm sure they'll come in and out of fashion. Dave, pitfalls? I've got a couple. They're both short. The first one is ego lifting. 
yeah. picking exercises that you can put the most weight on. And it kind of links to what Rob was saying as well. Rather than doing a bench press or a dumbbell press, which is going to be a challenging exercise, they go on a chest press machine, they put the seat as high as they can, uh, and then they kind of like lean on it and they full stack and they think they're human. That's a big problem because they're then not getting the correct intensity and quality of movement. Yeah. And the other pitfall is that through what you guys are saying, like picking too many non-compound exercises or non-dumbbell based exercises, doing lots of little sets of loads of different things, they're not working as hard as they think they are. So they're not working hard enough They're because they're choosing their own exercises. As you say, you gravitate towards the easy stuff, the fun stuff, the stuff that you can put loads of weight on the bar. So you don't end up getting as difficult a session as you would have if someone was planning it for you or if it was like a properly structured session in your log. Yeah, Those I, are I, your big problems. I, I totally agree. I think that's the real advantage of having a trainer is that they force you to do things that you don't want to do. Yeah. Like, there's no way I'd be doing overhead squats if no. I wasn't doing some crazy squat plan because they're just horrible. <laughs> but I know that I've been trying to improve my squat. If I do an overhead squat and I do a box squat and I do lots of front squats, then I'll get that nice upright posture that I'm trying to nail, which helps me really move the most weight when I when I squat um, in there. And, uh, yeah, taking the easy way out, I, I was in the gym the other day there using a shoulder press machine. Um, a guy went on, did a set with me for two plates. I went on the machine, changed the whole angle, and it made it stricter. Moved the chair so I was in a different position, and then pressed it, and then asked him to have a shot, and he had to take a couple of plates off. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, who was really working hard there uh, when it comes to that? So it's it's doing the exercise correctly and choosing the right ones. For me, when I first started out, the gyms that I was always working out and didn't have equipment. So it was either you do a barbell or you go home. Like, but that for me led to a lot of problems in my approaches to, to training in later years where I just trained through injuries rather than taking a step back and, and using some of the other equipment which was on offer in, in the gym. And I think people get really stuck in these sort of patterns of thinking like, like you were saying, Natalie, that there's a lot of different ways you can do stuff that people think, oh, you can only do this. And this is actually where it is. And we know from all walks of life that the extreme is never where the answer really is. It very often is not black or white. It's some gray in between. And, and then the sets example is the same as that, that some can do more, some need less. Exercise selection is exactly the same. Some of stuff's going to work with some people, other stuff necessarily going to work with, uh, with other people. I want to ask you though, guys, I mean, top exercises for... Legs, Rob, go. Top favorite two. Just quick round on this. Quick fire. Um oh, can we just say quads? Yeah, quads go. Uh barbell squats. Yep. And leg extensions. Leg extensions. Natalie, quads. Uh sissy squat is a massive one, and also obviously barbell squats. Barbell squats. Dave. Uh just to be different from the guys, uh elevated leg press with good depth. And barbell back lunges. Barbell back lunges. And I will go with back squat and uh, leg press, 45 degree. Okay. Um, chest, Rob. Best exercise for that? Best two? Oh. Incline barbell, pec deck or cable fly. Okay. Natalie? I'd have to just do sort of classic um, bench press. Just flat bench press and also like um, some like dumbbell flies as well. Dumbbell flies. Dave? Bench press, incline press. So yeah, and I, I'm going to go two for two on that bench press and, and incline press. And then last but not least, let's go at the back. Uh, Rob? Deadlifts, pull up. Deadlifts, pull up. Natalie? Um, I like T-bar row um, and also uh, bent over rows. Okay. Um, Dave? I'm not as heavy as Rob, so my pull-ups need to be weighted. So weighted pull-ups and uh, like a seated row. Uh, and I'll go bent over row and um, pull-ups myself, weighted if, if possible. Those those are my, my sort of favourite ones. Um, multi-joint exercises versus 
single joint exercises, guys. What, what do we think? Do you need to do them for a start? That would be the first sort of thing that I'd put to use uh, on there. And, and how many different types of exercise do you need in your session? So we said earlier on, okay, we're maybe looking at somewhere between five to 12 sets. So how many exercises is that a session? I'm going to come to you, uh, Natalie, first on that. How many exercises does that mean then? So normally about sort of five, I reckon five different exercises. And I would try not to do, you know, I would do a maximum of kind of two multi-joint exercises in that. Yeah. Um, no more than that. Quite often I would just do, you know, one big compound and then kind of do the sort of single joint exercises around that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll come into that compound movement, you know, via a pre-exhaust. So the single joint into the compound, you know, mm -hmm. depending on, you know, whether you're training, you know, if you're training alone, I find sometimes, particularly if you're squatting sometimes, the pre-exhaust can be really useful because you don't have to go as heavy. Um, sort of on your compound movements, particularly if you haven't got a spot and you don't feel particularly yeah. confident pushing the weight. So I find that's a really, really good way of get, keeping that intensity in. But certainly if you're thinking about, you know, your multi-joint exercises, what you've got to take into consideration is kind of the, the sort of the, the level of CNS fatigue that you're going to accumulate over that session. And again, it comes back to that maximum recoverable volume. So you've got to kind of weigh up a kind of cost benefit. <laughs> Um, around doing, you know, too many more joint exercises in a session, I think. Yeah, I think that's good, good um, uh, thinking about the exercise selection. And I would probably say that I follow something probably kind of similar to what you're saying uh, around that. Uh, Rob, yourself? Yeah, um, nine times out of ten in a session, it's going to be, it's going to be two kind of multi-joint. And then, so that would be between two exercises between four and six sets depending on the muscle group um i do quite like a um low approach especially at the moment in training and um using some intensity methods on probably two out of four if i was doing them i would be using intensity methods and then um single joint isolation movements uh, depending on the muscle group, shoulders, for example, do a few more just because of the, the complex of the delt. Um, chest, for example, it would um, maybe be two, two and two, two compound, um, multi joint, two isolation. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of I. Um, the only time I would do a third multi joint would actually be. Um, I use this quite a lot at the very end of my session. So, for example, I'll take legs, for example. Um, start on with a back squat. Um, doing a 45-degree leg press, I would then maybe do a, a hamstring curl, um, a leg extension, do kind of some isolation movements, and then finish with maybe like a lunge um, or another a goblet squat or something like that just to use it as an intensity method at the end to kind of really put yourself into the ground. No, it, it sounds like a hard session. It, it sounds like a session though, largely based around three weeks uh, for sure. And th those are difficult sessions. Um, yeah. Dave, exercise the, selection. Yeah, one of the big benefits of compound exercise is time efficiency. You're yeah. working more than one muscle group in one movement. So the first thing you've got to look at is how much time does the person this is programmed for have to train? So if they're really limited to that 45 minutes to an hour per session, like when I do, this is when all this thing you do when you do your programming with people, you've got to have a few compound movements in there because they don't have time to go through each individual one. I mean, if you take, for example, a bent over row, a bent over row with a barbell, you're working your hamstrings, your glutes, your core, your lower back, your lats, your biceps, your rear delts. If you were to break that down into individual movements, you'd be looking at good mornings or back extensions. You'd be looking at rows. You'd be looking at re reverse flies. Three exercises to get the bang for the buck of one. So if someone's going to be short on time, and also depending on how you're programming their training, sometimes you could have up to four. Because if you were doing, for example, a push-pull program with people, agonist-antagonist type deal, they might have bench press and dumbbell press, and then they might have bent over row and some said two arm dumbbell row that's four compound exercises in one session but it's not hammering the same muscle group with all four 
So in some situations, it is going to be quite doable. But if the person has like unlimited time or they have an un injury that you need to be aware of, obviously you would just shape it around that. I mean, like yourselves, I tend to be somewhere in the middle. I have enough time to train that I could do more isolation work. But I think compounds are important if you want to build a thicker physique as well, because some of those little interconnected muscles, you can't really target with isolation exercises or with machines. You do need that free weight, that row, that bench press, that overhead press to really kind of get everything recruited that you want to have a good looking physique. Yeah, do you know, do you know what? I, one of my observations, and, and thanks for that, Dave, is that I see a lot of guys who do a lot of machine lifting and not a lot of compound lifting or, or free weight lifting. And very often their physiques don't have the flow to them that some guy who's done a lot more um, free weight lifting, who's got all those smaller muscle groups developed so they have that nice flow, flow to, to physique. And very often I've heard people describe these as Frankenstein physiques, big arms, but the gap between the arms and the shoulders to the chest isn't quite as developed yeah. uh, from there. And you, you sometimes see this sort of stuff um, on there. Um, I can, again, come at this with a little bit of research on this if you guys want to sort of hear a little bit on this. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of, like, say, comparing regional areas of the body and multi-joint training on uh, on this one, and again, that this study that I'm going to quote here is kind of really representative of, of the area. So this is uh, Zabaleta Corti et al. 2021, and, and they're looking at sort of say, okay, well, what happens if you just train Smith machine squat versus leg extension uh, six sets, and you look at muscle development over the course of say six to eight weeks. And what happens is unsurprisingly, uh, you get greater development in different areas of the muscle compared to if you identify using one muscle, uh, one exercise versus the, the other one. Don't necessarily get greater hypertrophy, but certain areas of, the, of that leg itself, when you break down the thigh between the uh, intermedialis, last lateralis, et cetera, is more and more developed. Now, I'm not surprised by that at all. And if you look at the general trend in this, what you tend to see is if you take, again, your, your 12 sets or whatever it is that you're doing, and you look at, again, okay, someone just does squat versus someone does squat, leg press, and leg extension, the development and very often the strength overall is greater by having that selection of more exercises. Because as you pointed out, Rob, with your example for the, the shoulder training, muscles are complicated. They don't often work in just that one singular movement pattern um, and if you only work one particular movement pattern that's how you only end up getting development in those those individual planes and um, guys i think we're going to wrap up the round table discussion at this point here i i want to thank you for your time and your contributions on um on this one i knew it was going to be a big ask to get through all the different topics that i've got on here when i when i came in on it on this one but we covered sets and we covered uh, exercise selection. And I think there's a lot of good stuff uh, on here. Has anyone got anything brief you want to say just before I wrap this up? No. No, okay. Well, all that's left for me to say then, guys, is um, if you enjoyed this, please do check out the rest of our content on uh, on YouTube, on uh, Facebook, and on the Instagram. If you think we can help you once again, um, please do contact us at www.proprepcoaching.com. I'm Dr. Andrew Spell. We've got Rob, Natalie, and uh, Dave here, our pro prep coaches. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your time. And uh, please do get in touch. We hope you enjoyed this. And this will hopefully be the first of uh, many discussions that we do. Peace out. Thanks for your time. Yeah.